It was morning, and the new sun sparkled gold across the ripples of a gentle sea. A mile from shore, a fishing boat chummed the water, and the word for breakfast flock flashed through the air, till a crowd of a thousand seagulls came to dodge and fight for bits of food. It was another busy day beginning. But way off alone, out by himself, beyond boat and shore, Jonathan Livingston Seagull was practicing. A hundred feet in the sky, he lowered his webbed feet, lifted his beak and strained to hold a painful, hard, twisting curve through his wings. The curve meant that he would fly slowly, and now he slowed until the wind was a whisper in his face until the ocean stood still beneath him. He narrowed his eyes in fierce concentration, held his breath, forced one single more inch of curve. Then his feathers ruffled, he stalled and fell. To stall in the air for a seagull is disgrace and dishonor. But Jonathan Livingston Seagull, unashamed, stretching his wings again in that trembling hard curve, slowing, slowing and stalling once more, was no ordinary bird. Most skulls don't bother to learn more than how to get from shore to food and back again. It is not flying that matters, but eating. For this skull, though, it was not eating that mattered, but flight. More than anything else, Jonathan Livingston Seagull loved to fly. This kind of thinking he found is not the way to make oneself popular with other birds. Even his parents were dismayed as Jonathan spent whole days alone making hundreds of low-level glides, experimenting. Why, John, why, his mother asked. Why is it so hard to be like the rest of the flock, John? Why can't you leave low flying to the pelicans, the albatross? Why don't you eat? Son, your bone and feathers. I don't mind being bone and feathers, Mum. I just want to know what I can do in the air and what I can't. That's all. I just want to know. See here, Jonathan, said his father, not unkindly. Winter isn't far away. Boats will be few, and the surface fish will be swimming deep. If you must study, then study food and how to get it. Don't you forget that the reason you fly is to eat. Jonathan nodded obediently. For the next few days, he tried to behave like the other gulls. He really tried screeching and fighting with the flock around the piers and the fishing boats, diving on scraps of fish and bread. But he couldn't make it work. It's all so pointless, he thought, deliberately dropping a hard-won anchovy to a hungry old gull chasing him. I could be spending all this time learning to fly. There's so much to learn. It wasn't long before Jonathan Gull was off by himself again, far out to sea, Hungry, happy, learning. The subject was speed, and in a week's practice he learned more about speed than the fastest gull alive. From a thousand feet, flapping his wings as hard as he could, he pushed over into a blazing steep dive towards the waves and learned why seagulls don't make blazing steep power dives. In just six seconds, he was moving 70 miles per hour, the speed at which one's wings goes unstable on the upstroke. He couldn't be more careful enough on that upstroke. Ten times he tried, and all ten times, as he passed through 70 miles per hour, he burst into a churning mass of feathers, out of control, crashing down into the water. The key, he thought at last, dripping wet, must be to hold the wings still at high speeds, to flap up to 50 and then hold the wings still. From 2,000 feet he tried again, rolling into his dive, beak straight down, wings full out and stable from the moment he passed 50 miles per hour. It took tremendous strength, 
but it worked. But victory was short-lived. The instant he began his pull-out, the instant he changed the angle of his wings, he snapped into that same terrible, uncontrolled disaster. And at 90 miles per hour, it hit him like dynamite. Jonathan Siegel exploded in midair and smashed down into the brick-hard sea. When he came to, it was well after dark, and he floated in moonlight on the surface of the ocean. His wings were ragged bars of lead, but the weight of failure was even heavier on his back. He wished feebly that the weight could be just enough to drag him gently down to the bottom and end it all. As he sank low in the water, a strange hollow voice sounded within him. There's no way around it. I am a seagull. I am limited by my nature. If I were meant to learn so much about flying, I'd have charts for brains. If I were meant to fly at speed, I'd have a fork and short wings and live on mice instead of fish. My father was right. I must forget this foolishness. I must fly home to the flock and be content as I am, as a poor, limited seagull. The voice faded, and Jonathan agreed. The place for a seagull at night is on shore, and from this moment forth he vowed he would be a normal gull. It would make everyone happier. He pushed wearily away from the dark water and flew towards the land, grateful for what he had learned about flying. He felt better for his decision to be just another one of the flock. There would be no ties now to the force that had driven him to learn. There would be no more challenge and no more failure. And it was pretty just to stop thinking and fly through the dark towards the lights above the beach. A voice cracked in alarm. Seagulls never fly in the dark. Get down! If you were meant to fly in the dark, you'd have the eyes of an owl. You'd have a falcon short wings. Short wings? A falcon short wings? That's the answer. He climbed 2,000 feet above the Black Sea, and without a moment for thought of failure and death, he brought his four wings tightly into his body, left only the narrow, swept daggers of his wingtips extended into the wind, and fell into a vertical dive. The wind was a monster roar at his head. 70 miles per hour, 90, 120, and faster still. The wing strain now at 140 miles per hour wasn't nearly as hard as it had been before at 70. And with the faintest twist of his wingtips, he eased out of the dive and shot above the waves, a grey cannonball under the moon. He closed his eyes to slits against the wind and rejoiced. 140 miles per hour and under control. If I dive from 5,000 feet instead of 2,000, I wonder how fast. His vows of a moment before were forgotten, swept away in that great swift wind. Yet he felt guiltless breaking the promises he had made himself. Such promises are only for gulls that accept the ordinary. One who has touched excellence in his learning has no need of that kind of promise. By sunup, Jonathan Gull was practicing again. From 5,000 feet, the fishing boats were specks in the flat blue water. Breakfast flock was a faint cloud of dust motes circling. He was alive, trembling ever so slightly with delight, proud that his fear was under control. 
He hugged in his forewings, extended his short, angled wingtips, and plunged directly towards the sea. The wind was a solid beating wall of sound against which he could move no faster. He was flying now straight down, and at 214 miles per hour, he swallowed, knowing if his wings unfolded at that speed, he'd be blown into a million tiny shreds of seagull. But the speed was power, the speed was joy, the speed was pure beauty. He began his pull out at a thousand feet, the boat and the crowd of gulls tilting and growing meteor fast directly in his path. He couldn't stop. He didn't know yet how to turn at that speed. Collision would be instant death. And so he shut his eyes. Jonathan Livingston Seagull fired directly through the center of breakfast flock, eyes closed in a great roaring shriek of wind and feathers. The gull of fortune smiled upon him this once, and no one was killed. His thoughts were triumph, terminal velocity. A seagull at 214 miles per hour, it was a breakthrough. The greatest single moment in the history of the flock. And in that moment, a new age opened for Jonathan Gull. Flying out to his lonely practice area, folding his wings for a dive from 8,000 feet, he set himself at once to discover how to turn. A single wingtip feather, he found, moved at a fraction of an inch, gives a smooth, sweeping curve at tremendous speed. Before he learned this, however, he found that moving more than one feather at that speed will spin you like a rifle ball. And Jonathan had flown the first aerobatics of any seagull on earth. He spared no time that day for talk with other gulls, but flew on past sunset. He discovered the loop, the slow roll, the point roll, the inverted spin, the pinwheel. When Jonathan Seagull joined the flock on the beach, it was full night. When they hear of the breakthrough, he thought, they'll be wild with joy. How much more there is now to living. Instead of our drabs slogging forth and back to the fishing boats, there is a reason to life. We can lift ourselves out of ignorance. We can find ourselves as creatures of excellence and intelligence and skill. We can be free. We can learn to fly. The years ahead hummed and glowed with promise. The gulls were flocked into the council gathering when he landed, and apparently had been so flocked for some time. They were, in fact, waiting. Jonathan Livingston Seagull, stand to center, said the elder. Stand to center meant only great shame or great honor. Stand to center for honor was the way the gulls' foremost leaders were marked. Of course, he thought. The breakfast flocked this morning. They saw the breakthrough. But I want no honors. I have no wish to be leader. I want only to share what I've found, to show those horizons out ahead for us all. He stepped forward. Jonathan Livingston Seagull, stand to center for shame in the sight of your fellow gulls. It felt like being hit with a board. His knees went weak. His feathers sagged. There was a roaring in his ears. Centered for shame. Impossible. The breakthrough. They can't understand. They're wrong. They're wrong. To be centered for shame meant that he would be cast out of Gull society, banished to the solitary life on the far cliffs. One day you shall learn that irresponsibility does not pay. Life is the unknown and the unknowable. Except that we are put into this world to eat, to stay alive as long as we possibly can. A seagull never speaks back to the council flock, but it was Jonathan's voice raised. Irresponsibility? My brothers? Who is more responsible than the gull who finds and follows a meaning, a higher purpose for life? For a thousand years we have scrabbled after fish heads, but now we have a reason to live, to learn, to discover, to be free. Give me one chance, let me show you what I found. The flock might as well have been stoned. The brotherhood is broken. 
the gulls intoned together. And with one accord, they solemnly closed their ears and turned their backs upon him. Jonathan Siegel spent the rest of his days alone. But he flew away out beyond the far cliffs. What he had once hoped for the flock, he now gained for himself alone. He learned to fly and was not sorry for the price that he had paid. Jonathan Siegel discovered that boredom and fear and anger are the reasons that a girl's life is so short. And with these gone from his thought, he lived a long, fine life indeed. They came in the evening and found Jonathan gliding peacefully and alone through his beloved sky. The two gulls that appeared at his wings were pure as starlight, and the glow from them was gentle and friendly in the high night air. But most lovely of all was the skill with which they flew their wingtips moving a precise and constant inch from his own. Without a word, Jonathan put them to his test, a test that no gull had ever passed. He twisted his wings, slowed to a single mile per hour above storm. The two radiant birds slowed with him, smoothly locked in position. They knew about slow flying. He folded his wings, rolled, and dropped in a dive to 190 miles per hour. They dropped with him, streaking down in flawless formation. At last he turned that speed straight up into a long, vertical, slow roll. They rolled with him, smiling. He recovered to level flight and was quiet for a time before he spoke. Very well, he said. Who are you? We are from your flock, Jonathan. We are your brothers. We've come to take you higher, to take you home. Home, I have none. Flock, I have none. I am outcast. And we fly now at the peak of the great mountain wind. Beyond a few hundred feet, I can lift this old body no higher. But you can, Jonathan. For you have learned. One school is finished, and the time has come for another to begin. As it had shined across him all his life, so understanding lighted that moment for Jonathan Siegel. They were right. He could fly higher, and it was time to go home. He gave one last long look across the sky, across that magnificent silver land where he had learned so much. I'm ready, he said at last. And Jonathan Livingston Seagull rose with the two star-bright gulls to disappear into a perfect dark sky. So this is heaven. He had to smile at himself. It was hardly respectful to analyze heaven in the very moment that one flies up to enter it. As he came from Earth now, above the clouds and in close formation with the two brilliant gulls, he saw that his own body was growing as bright as theirs. True, the same young Jonathan Siegel was there that had always lived behind his golden eyes but the outer form had changed. It felt like a seagull body, but already it flew far better than his old one had ever flown. Why, with half the effort, he thought, I'll get twice the speed, twice the performance of my best days on Earth. His feathers glowed brilliant white now, and his wings were smooth and perfect as sheets of polished silver. He began delightedly to learn about them, to press power into these new wings. The clouds broke apart. His escorts called, Happy Landings, Jonathan, and vanished. 
into thin air. He was flying over the sea toward a jagged shoreline. A few seagulls were working the updrafts on the cliffs. Away off to the north, at the horizon itself, flew a few others. New sights, new thoughts, new questions. Why so few gulls? Heaven should be flocked with gulls. Why am I so tired all at once? Gulls in heaven are never supposed to be tired or to sleep. Where had he heard that? The memory of his life on earth was falling away. Earth had been a place where he had learned so much, of course, but the details were blurred. Something about fighting for food and being outcast. The dozen gulls by the shoreline came to meet him, none saying a word. He felt only that he was welcome and that this was home. It had been a big day for him, a day whose sunrise he no longer remembered. He turned to land on the beach, beating his wings to stop an inch in the air, then dropping lightly to the sand. The other gulls landed too, but not one of them so much as flapped a feather. They swung into the wind, bright wings outstretched. Then somehow they changed the curve of their feathers until they stopped in the same instant as their feet touched the ground. It was beautiful control. But now Jonathan was just too tired to try it. Standing there on the beach, still without a word spoken, he was asleep. In the days that followed, Jonathan saw that there was as much to learn about flight in this place as there had been in the life behind him, but with a difference. Here were gulls who thought as he thought. For each of them, the most important thing in living was to reach out and touch perfection in that which they most loved to do, and that was to fly. They were magnificent birds, all of them and they spent hour after hour every day practicing flight. For a long time, Jonathan forgot about the world that he had come from, but now and then, just for a moment, he remembered. He remembered it one morning when he was out with his instructor on the beach. Where is everybody, Sullivan? Where I came from, there were thousands and thousands of gulls, I know, Sullivan shook his head. The only answer I can see, Jonathan, is that you are pretty well a one in a million bird. Most of us came along ever so slowly. We went from one world into another that was almost exactly like it. Forgetting right away where we had come from, not caring where we were headed. Living for the moment. Do you have any idea how many lives we must have gone through before we even got the first idea that there is more to life than eating or fighting or power in the flock? A thousand lives, Jonathan? Ten thousand? And then another hundred lives until we begin to learn that there is such a thing as perfection. And another hundred again to get the idea that our purpose for living is to find that perfection and show it forth. The same rule holds for us all now, of course. We choose our next world through what we learn in this one. Learn nothing and the next world is the same as this one. All the same limitations the lead waits to overcome. He stretched his wings and turned to face the wind. But you, John, he said, learned so much at one time that you didn't have to go through a thousand lives to reach this one. One evening, the gulls that were not night flying stood together on the sand, thinking. Jonathan took all his courage in hand and walked to the elder gull, who, instead of being enfeebled by age, had been empowered by it. Chiang, yes, my son. This world isn't heaven at all, is it? You are learning again, Jonathan Seagull. Well, what happens from here? Where are we going? Is there no such place as heaven? No, Jonathan, there is no such place. Heaven is not a place. It is not a time. Heaven is being perfect. You are a very fast flyer, aren't you? I... I enjoy speed. You will begin to touch heaven, Jonathan, in the moment that you touch perfect speed. And that isn't flying a thousand miles an hour or a million or flying at the speed of light. Because any number is a limit and perfection doesn't have limits. Perfect speed, my son, is being there. 
Without warning, Chiang vanished and appeared at the water's edge 50 feet away, all in a flicker of an instant. Then he vanished again and stood in the same millisecond at Jonathan's shoulder. It's kind of fun, he said. Jonathan was dazzled. He forgot to ask about heaven. How did you do that? What does it feel like? How far can you go? You can go to any place and to any time that you wish to go. I've gone everywhere and every when I can think of. It's strange. The gulls who scorn perfection for the sake of travel go nowhere slowly. Those who put aside travel for the sake of perfection go anywhere instantly. Remember, Jonathan, heaven isn't a place or a time because place and time are so very meaningless. Heaven is, can you teach me to fly like that? Of course, if you wish to learn. I wish. When can we start? We could start now, if you'd like. I want to learn to fly like that. Tell me what to do. To fly as fast as thought to anywhere that is, you must begin by knowing that you already arrived. The trick, according to Chiang, was for Jonathan to stop seeing himself as trapped inside a limited body that had a 42-inch wingspan and a performance that could be plotted on a chart. The trick was to know that his true nature lived as perfect as an unwritten number, everywhere at once, across space and time. Jonathan kept at it fiercely, day after day, from before sunrise till past midnight. And for all his effort, he moved not a feather width from his spot. Forget about faith, Chiang said it time and again. You didn't need faith to fly. You needed to understand flying. This is just the same. Now try again. Then one day, Jonathan, standing on the shore, closing his eyes, concentrating, all in a flash, knew what Chiang had been telling him. Why, that's true. I am a perfect, unlimited gull. He felt a great shock of joy. Good, said Chiang, and there was victory in his voice. Jonathan opened his eyes. He stood alone with the elder on a totally different seashore. Trees down to the water's edge, twin yellow suns turning overhead. At last you've got the idea, Chiang said, but your control needs a little work. Jonathan was stunned. Where are we? Utterly unimpressed with the strange surroundings, the Elder brushed the question aside. We're on some planet, obviously, with a green sky and a double star for a sun. Jonathan made a scree of delight, the first sound he had made since he had left Earth. It works! Well, of course it works, John, said Chiang. It always works when you know what you're doing. Now, about your control. By the time they returned, it was dark. The other gulls looked at Jonathan with awe in their golden eyes, for they had seen him disappear from where he had been rooted for so long. He stood their congratulations for less than a minute. I am the newcomer here. I'm just beginning. It is I who must learn from you. I wonder about that, John, said Sullivan, standing near. You have less fear of learning than any gull I've seen in 10,000 years. The flock fell silent, and Jonathan fidgeted in embarrassment. We can start working with time if you wish, said Chiang, till you can fly the past and the future, and then you will be ready to begin the most difficult, the most powerful, the most fun of all. You will be ready to begin to fly up and know the meaning of kindness and of love. He always had learned quickly from ordinary experiences, and now, the special student of the Elder himself, he took in new ideas like a streamlined, feathered computer. But then the day came that Cheyenne vanished. He had been talking quietly with them all, exhorting them never to stop their learning and their practicing, and their striving to understand more of the perfect, invisible principle of all life. Then, as he spoke, his feathers went brighter and brighter, and at last turned so brilliant that no girl could look upon him. Jonathan, he said, and these were the last words that he spoke. Keep on working on love. 
when they could see again, Chiang was gone. As the days went past, Jonathan found himself thinking time and again of the earth from which he had come. If he had known there just a tenth, just a hundredth of what he knew here, how much more life would have meant. He stood on the sand and fell to wondering if there was a gull back there who might be struggling to break out of his limits, to see the meaning of flight beyond a way of travel to get a breadcrumb from a rowboat. Perhaps there might even have been one made outcast for speaking his truth in the face of the flock. And the more Jonathan practiced his kindness lessons, and the more he worked to know the nature of love, the more he wanted to go back to Earth. For in spite of his lonely past, Jonathan Siegel was born to be an instructor. And his own way of demonstrating love was to give something of the truth that he had seen to a girl who asked only a chance to see truth for himself. Sullivan, adept now at thought speed flight and helping the others to learn, was doubtful. John, you were outcast once. Why do you think that any of the gulls in your old times would listen to you now? You know the proverb, and it's true. The gull sees farthest who flies highest. Those gulls where you came from are standing on the ground, squawking and fighting amongst themselves. They're a thousand miles from heaven. And you say you want to show them heaven from where they stand. John, they can't see their own wingtips. Stay here. Help the new gulls here the ones who are high enough to see what you have to tell them. He was quiet for a moment, and then he said, What if Cheyenne had gone back to his old worlds? Where would you have been today? The last point was the telling one, and Sullivan was right. The gull sees farthest, who flies highest. Jonathan stayed and worked with the new birds coming in. They were all very bright and quick with their lessons. But the old feeling came back, and he couldn't help but think that there might be one or two girls back on Earth who would be able to learn too. How much more he would have known by now if Cheyenne had come to him on the day that he was outcast. Sully, I must go back, he said at last. Sullivan sighed, but he did not argue. I think I'll miss you, Jonathan, was all he said. Sully for shame, Jonathan said in reproach, and don't be foolish. What are we trying to practice every day? If our friendship depends on things like space and time, then when we finally overcome space and time, we've destroyed our own brotherhood. But overcome space, and all we have left is here. Overcome time, and all we have left is now. And in the middle of here and now, don't you think that we might see each other once or twice? Sullivan Seagull laughed in spite of himself. You crazy bird, he said kindly. If anyone can show someone on the ground how to see a thousand miles, it will be Jonathan Livingston Seagull. He looked at the sand. Goodbye, John, my friend. Goodbye, Sully. We'll meet again. And with that, Jonathan held in thought an image of the great gull flocks on the shore of another time. And he knew with practiced ease that he was not bone and feathers, but a perfect idea of freedom and flight, limited by nothing at all. Fletcher Lynn Seagull was still quite young, but already he knew that no bird had ever been so harshly treated by any flock or with so much injustice. I don't care what they say, he thought fiercely and his vision blurred as he flew out towards the far cliffs. There's so much more to flying than just flapping around from place to place. Uh, uh, a mosquito does that. One little barrel roll around the elder gull, just for fun and I'm outcast. Are they blind? Can't they see? Can't they think of the glory that it will be when we really learn to fly? I don't care what they think. I'll show them what flying is. I'll be pure outlaw, if that's the way they want it. And I'll make them so sorry. The voice came inside his own head. And though it was very gentle, it startled him so much that he faltered and stumbled in the air. Don't be harsh on them, Fletcher Seagull. In casting you out, the other gulls have only hurt themselves. And one day, they will know this. And one day they will see what you see. Forgive them and help them to understand. 
An inch from his right wing tip flew the most brilliant white gull in all the world, gliding effortlessly along, not moving a feather, at what was very nearly Fletcher's top speed. There was a moment of chaos in the young bird. What's going on? Am I mad? Am I dead? What is this? Low and calm, the voice went on within his thoughts, demanding an answer. Fletcher Lynn Seagull, do you want to fly? Yes, I want to fly. Fletcher Lynn Seagull, do you want to fly so much that you will forgive the flock and learn and go back to them one day and work to help them know? There was no lying to this magnificent, skillful being. No matter how proud or how hurt a bird was Fletcher Seagull. I do, he said softly. Then Fletcher, that bright creature, said to him, and the voice was very kind. Let's begin with level flight. Jonathan circled slowly over the far cliffs, watching. This rough young Fletcher Gull was very nearly a perfect flight student. He was strong and light and quick in the air, but far and away, more important, he had a blazing drive to learn to fly. By the end of three months, Jonathan had six other students, outcasts all, yet curious about the strange new idea of flight, for the joy of flying. Still, it was easier for them to practice high performance than it was to understand the reason behind it. Each of us is in truth an idea of the great gull, an unlimited idea of freedom, Jonathan would say in the evenings on the beach. And precision flying is a step towards expressing our real nature. Everything that limits us, we have to put aside. And that's why all this high-speed practice and low-speed and aerobatics. And his students would be asleep, exhausted from the day's flying. They liked the practice because it was fast and exciting, and it fed a hunger for learning that grew with every lesson. But not one of them, not even Fletcher Lind Gull, had come to believe that the flight of ideas could possibly be as real as the flight of wind and feather. Your whole body, from wingtip to wingtip, Jonathan would say other times, is nothing more than your thought itself, in a form you can see. Break the chains of your thought, and you break the chains of your body too. But no matter how he said it, it sounded like pleasant fiction, and they needed more to sleep. It was only a month later that Jonathan said the time had come to return to the flock. There was a brief anguish amongst his students, for it is the law of the flock that an outcast never returns and the law had not been broken once in 10,000 years. Despite this, they flew in from the west that morning, eight of them in a double diamond formation, wingtips almost overlapping. They came across the Flock's Council Beach at 135 miles per hour, Jonathan in the lead, Fletcher smoothly at his right wing, Henry Calvin struggling gamely at his left, and the whole formation rolled slowly to the right as one bird, level to inverted to level, the wind whipping over them all. The squawks and the grokles of everyday life in the flock were cut off as though the formation were a giant knife, and 8,000 gull eyes watched without a single blink. One by one, each of the eight birds pulled sharply upward into a full loop and flew all the way around to a dead slow stand-up landing on the sand. It went like lightning through the flock. Those birds are outcast, and they have returned, and that... 
That can't happen. Well, okay, they are outcasts, said some of the younger gulls. But where do they learn to fly like that? It took almost an hour for the word of the elder to pass through the flock. Ignore them. The gull who speaks to an outcast is himself outcast. The gull who looks upon an outcast breaks the law of the flock. Grey feathered backs were turned upon Jonathan from that moment onward, but he didn't appear to notice. He held his practice session directly over the council beach and for the first time began pressing his students to the limit of their ability. Every hour he was there at the side of each of his students, demonstrating, suggesting, pressuring, guiding. He flew with them through night and cloud and storm for the sport of it, while the flock huddled miserably on the ground. When the flying was done, the students relaxed on the sand, and in time they listened more closely to Jonathan. He had some crazy ideas that they couldn't understand, but then he had some good ones that they could. Gradually, in the night, Another circle formed around the circle of students, a circle of curious gulls listening in the darkness for hours on end, not wishing to see or be seen of one another, fading away before daybreak. It was a month after the return that the first gull of the flock crossed the line and asked to learn how to fly. In his asking, Terence Lowell Gull became a condemned bird, labelled outcast and the eighth of Jonathan's students. The next night from the flock came Kirk Maynard Gull, wobbling across the sand, dragging his left wing to collapse at Jonathan's feet. Help me, he said very quietly, speaking in the way that the dying speak. I want to fly more than anything else in the world. Come along then, said Jonathan. Climb with me away from the ground and we'll begin. You don't understand my wing. I can't move my wing. Maynard Gull, you have the freedom to be yourself, your true self, here and now, and nothing can stand in your way. It is the law of the great Gull, the law that is. Are you saying I can fly? I say you are free. As simply and as quickly as that, Kirk Maynard Gull spread his wings effortlessly and lifted into the dark night air. The flock were aroused from sleep by his cry, as loud as he could scream it from 5,000 feet up. I can fly! Listen, I can fly! By sunrise, there were nearly a thousand birds standing outside the circle of students, looking curiously at Maynard. They didn't care whether they were seen or not, and they listened, trying to understand Jonathan Seagull. He spoke of very simple things, that it is right for a gull to fly, that freedom is the very nature of his being, that whatever stands against that freedom must be set aside, be it ritual or superstition or limitation of any form. Set aside came a voice from the multitude, even if it be the law of the flock. The only true law is that which leads to freedom, Jonathan said. There is no other. How do you expect us to fly as you fly, came another voice. You are special and gifted and divine above other birds. The price of being misunderstood, Jonathan thought. They call you devil or they call you God. Why is it, Jonathan puzzled, that the hardest thing in the world is to convince a bird that he is free and that he can prove it for himself if he just spend a little time practicing? Why should it be so hard? Jonathan sighed and looked out to sea. You don't need me any longer. You need to keep finding yourselves a little more each day. A moment later, Jonathan's body wavered in the air, shimmering, and began to go transparent. Don't let them spread silly rumors about me, or make me a god. I am a seagull. I like to fly. 
the shimmering stopped. Jonathan Seagull had vanished into empty air. <laughs>